championships and you underestimate them at your peril. If anyone knows this, it's the Texas Rangers, a Yankee stepping stone to their last two world titles. A year ago, Texas could muster only one run in three futile games. They've now lost six straight postseason games to New York. But the Rangers boast a trio of potential Hall of Famers, and this is the best Ranger team ever. Will they stop the Bronx Bombers from bullying them again, or will the Yankees toss them aside as they pursue world championship number 25? Game one next. 95 world championships contested in this century. World Series didn't start till 1903. Then they skipped a year. And of course, in 94, the season ended before they could play a World Series. Potentially, they could win 25 of 95 in the century. The Budweiser starting lineup. The four hitters, two through five, all topped 100 RBIs. And Zeal in the number six slot just missed with 98. Rafael Palmero continuing his march toward the Hall of Fame, second behind Matty Ramirez in slugging percentage, second in the league to Ramirez in RBIs, and one behind Ken Griffey Jr., 47 to 48, for the league home run leadership. And the thing that impresses me about this lineup, Bob, is that you have a left-handed hitter, right-handed hitter, left-handed hitter, right-handed hitter, all through the lineup. You cannot bring in a reliever and let him pitch to two or three hitters in a row. This is almost a perfect lineup. That's how you try to match your lineup. And this is the lineup that Orlando Hernandez will have to face. And the key to me, Bob, is he's going to have to be able to pitch these left-handers inside to keep them honest. But pitching them inside here at Yankee Stadium, if you make the slightest mistake, they will pop it into the right field stand. So he's going to have to have sharp control, and he's going to have to be able to change speeds well. And let's take a look at the defense behind Hernandez. And they've highlighted Chuck Knobloch, and you can see why. He had 26 errors, and that led all Major League second basemen in errors. And he has struggled at times with his throwing this year. And But he's a gamer, and he's played well in the past, and the Yankees only hope that he can bounce back. Back of the plate, Jorge Posada has committed 17 pass balls. It's a very high figure. There's no knuckleballer on this staff. This isn't Jason Baratek trying to handle Tim Wakefield in Boston. 17 pass balls, and he doesn't even catch close to every day because Girardi gets some of the work. But one of the things we should know, Bob, is with those errors, they have made, they have, they have given up 30 more unearned runs this year than they did last year. That tells you that they're not playing nearly as well defensively. But it's almost impossible to play as well as the Yankees did last year. I mean, they won more games than anybody in the history of the American League. So it's, you can't always measure them against last year's standards. There's Joe Girardi. He's part of the catching core. And there you see Joe Torre and... Uh, Don Zimmer, and Don Zimmer is, is one of those guys that we always look at, and they call him Popeye. He has a baseball face. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Popeye. <laughs> 51 years in baseball at age 68, filled in as the manager when prostate cancer early in the season sidelined Joe Torre for the campaign's first six weeks. Mark McLemore heading toward the plate to start it off. A year ago, these teams met in the first round. The Yankees swept it. They came in 26 games better than Texas for the regular season. This year, they're separated by only three games. Brocious in close at third. Strike at the knees. The plate umpire is Jim Joyce. Chuck Merriweather at first. Tim Welke at second. Crew chief Jim McKean at third. Left field line John Shulock. Right field line Derwood Merrill. 0 oh 2. El Duque led the Yankees in innings pitched. Almost always will get you to the seventh inning and maybe through it. And then turn it over to the bullpen. A line drive to right. O'Neill comes on to take it. Well, we mentioned that he's going to have to pitch the left-handers inside to keep them honest. He got two strikes on McLemore, and he comes inside. He jammed him just enough that he couldn't get much lumber on it. But if he moves that ball out over the plate, he, he will have problems. On the other hand, He's murder on right-handed hitters. 
with the variety of breaking stuff and that arm angle of his. And, and here's Yvonne Rodriguez. I mean, you cannot discount him at the top of your list for the most valuable player in the league. He plays a very difficult position. He puts up all the offensive numbers of all the other big guys, and he can steal bases as well. Fouled away. Unless you're going to vote Pedro Martinez, the Cy Young Award winner and the MVP, I think if you're going with an everyday player, despite the great seasons that others have enjoyed in the American League, this would be my choice. And I think you just made the point of why an everyday player should get the nod. Nothing against Martinez. He's going to win the Cy Young Award. But when you have everyday players who are deserving, I think it should go to one of them. A line drive toward the gap in right center. Williams and O'Neill in pursuit. This ball is really carrying, and it's off the wall on the fly. Rodriguez pulls in with a one-out double. And that's the approach that he always takes. He's always going towards right field. If you hang something inside, he will pull it. But watch the pitch. It doesn't matter whether the fastball is inside or out over the plate. He still takes everything the other way. And watch the pitch. Out over the plate, and he rips it in the right center field. Stays back and uses his hands. Beautiful swing there by Yvonne Rodriguez. And he does that very well going the other way. Now Rusty Greer, easy to overlook in a power-laden lineup like this, but he knocked in 101. Orlando Hernandez is 1-2 lifetime against Texas. 0-1 this year. Didn't face them in the division series in 98. He was 2-0 in last year's postseason. Beat the Indians in the LCS, the Padres in the World Series. That victory in Cleveland in game four, the only time the Yankees really had their backs to the wall in the entire regular or postseason, they were down 2-1. That was the single biggest game pitched by any Yankee in 98. Through seven shutout innings that day. Down and in, 2-1. And, and Bob, that's the reason that Joe Torre decided to start Orlando Hernandez. He says he still remembers that game he pitched in Cleveland last year. And he also knows that he still has Andy Pettit, David Cohn, and Roger Clemens to fall back on. The 2 1 pitch misses three balls and a strike with Gonzalez waiting on deck. Rodriguez away from second. He doubled with one out. The 3 1 pitch to Rusty Greer. Misses inside. Two on for Juan Gonzalez. An RBI spot for a guy who's been an RBI machine. He's driven in 560 runs in the last 564 games he's played. And this is where Rafael Palmero really has a presence in this lineup. They know that if they pitch around Juan Gonzalez, they're going to have to deal with Palmero. And I think that helps Gonzalez to know that he doesn't have to take all the pressure when they have runners in scoring position. El Duque works to it. And gets ahead 0-1. Like everyone else in the Ranger lineup, Gonzalez was throttled last year in the Yankees' three-game sweep. But even though Texas lost in four games in 96, Gonzalez just about destroyed the Yankees. He had five home runs in the four games. The 0 1. In on his hands, popped wide of first. Martinez near the railing, no play. pitcher is looking at when he addresses the heart of this Ranger order. Four guys with better than 100 RBIs. The 
you imagine knocking in 148 and not leading the league? Matty Ramirez had 165 for Cleveland. The 0-2 pitch. Stopped by Posada. A ball and two strikes. Just watching the pattern that Hernandez is using here against Gonzalez. He wants to get him out with a breaking ball away, but you have to come inside every once in a while. He came in tight and he got the foul pop up. You have to establish that you will come inside or a guy like Gonzalez will go out over the plate and hurt you on any breaking ball that is a strike. Duque made Gonzalez wait too long. Remember that game four start at Cleveland. He was in deep first inning trouble. Jim Tomey launched one to right and barely missed sending it out. El Duque survived that and pitched seven shutout innings. In trouble in the first here. Off speed pitch misses two and two. One of the things you learn watching Juan Gonzalez is that he may swing at a few bad pitches early in the count, but he becomes more patient as he gets deeper into the count. El Duque wheels and looks Rodriguez back to second. Don't see many pitchers anymore with elaborate motions. In that sense, El Duque is a throwback. And he hides the ball very well with that high leg kick. Now the 2 2. Got a piece of it. Good pitch. I mean, that was an off speed sidearm breaking ball. And, and all Gonzalez could do was foul it off. He did a great job of just fouling it off. He doesn't go with the high leg kick here, but he comes sidearm, and he takes a lot off of it. Now watch where the pitch is, breaking off the plate, and Gonzalez just gets a piece of it. Another 2-2 pitch. Come out and miss. Beautiful pitch. Well, he, he definitely wanted to get him out with a breaking ball away. So he starts him off with a breaking ball away. Then he keeps him honest by coming inside. Now everything else is away. You only have to come inside once to keep him honest, and he did that. So he kept teasing him until he got him to go for the bad pitch off the plate. That is Orlando Hernandez at his best right there against a right-handed hitter. But this is, again, why I like the Texas lineup. Now he doesn't have that same pattern that he can use here against Palmero. He has to change his pattern here. So you can't get in a groove if you're not facing two or three right-handers in a row. Palmero brings some gaudy numbers to the plate, but not against El Duque. Hitless in 11 career at-bats versus Hernandez. from Villa Clara, Cuba, facing Palmero, born in Havana. Ball one. He's got Posada's sign. And his 1-0 pitch. 2-0 to Palmero. Todd Zeal on deck. The great thing about Palmero, Bob, is that he can handle any pitch, whether it be a changeup, curveball, slider, and he can hit them all out of the ballpark. So you have to always make a quality pitch, no matter what pitch you choose to throw. The hitter's pitch on 2-0. He runs it out to three balls and no strikes. And he definitely doesn't want to throw him a fastball. That was a 2-0 changeup. 
after he threw a one and oh change up. And there will be times in this series, this may not be the time, but where they, if they get Juan Gonzalez out, they will definitely pitch around Rafael Palmero. Palmero's got a green light here, I'm sure, if he sees something he likes. Definitely. It's in there. A lot of hitters do not like to swing 3 0 because they will swing at any pitch that comes up there. But, and again, Palmero doesn't have to hit cripples to be a good hitter. Hernandez working very deliberately, and now Posada wants to talk with him. The Hernandez family has been a major presence in the last two baseball postseasons. Half-brother LeVon Hernandez, now with the Giants, was 4-0 for the Marlins in 97, including two World Series victories. And then El Duque wins his only two starts in October last year. The 3-1 pitch, just off the outside corner, and the bases are loaded. And you can tell by his expression, he, El Duque wasn't really upset that he didn't throw a strike there. Everything's relative, so maybe he'd rather face Seal, but Seal for his career is a 524 hitter with the bases loaded. As you see, he has seven career grand slams, two of them this year. Just the makeup of this lineup is why I think this is a much better Texas team than they than the Yankee pitching staff faced last year. Cuts on the first one and comes up empty. Todd Zill is also a guy that will look for pitches early in the count, and right there he looked like he was looking for a fastball first pitch. He didn't get it. Now he will change his pattern a little bit, and he likes to shoot the ball to right center field, too. Bases loaded, two out, top of the first. A ball and a strike to Zeal. Torrey was Zeal's manager in St. Louis and did with him what had been done with Torrey himself in his own playing career. Switched him from catcher to third base. Duque in hot water on a chilly night. Brings it home on one and one and gets a hit now, a ball and two strikes. They come to their feet at Yankee Stadium. Rodriguez, Greer, and Palmero lead away. Two pitch. Struck him out. He walked two, he fanned two, and he stranded three. Threw in the top of the first. And mistakenly, we're looking at their lineup. They'll bat again in the next inning. How about the Yanks, you say? Well, it'll be Knobloch, Jeter, and O'Neill in the bottom of the first. Here they come. Jeter finished second behind Nomar Garcia Para of the Red Sox, 349 to 357 in the batting race, and led the majors with 219 hits. Like Texas, the Yankees have four 100 RBI men. But without disparaging any of those performances, it doesn't mean what it once did. 59 major leaguers drove in 100 or more this year. 59. That has to be a record, I would, I would assume. And there is Aaron Seeley. The difference in Seeley this year, he's always relied on his curveball when he got in trouble in the past. This year, he's using his fastball a little bit more. And let's take a look at the defense behind him. Yvonne Rodriguez, one pass ball the entire season. And, he, and he's probably going to win another gold glove. Probably. Yeah, he's put that in the bank. Unbelievable. He is such a great catcher that you just you take the running game out of the way you may hit and run but you do not have many guys trying just a straight steal against him. he threw out 53 percent of would-be base stealers no one else in the american league even reached 40 percent 
The Yankee catchers, just as a point of comparison, Posada and Girardi, each around 20 to 25 percent. And there isn't a lefty among the Texas starters, so he's not getting that much help holding runners close. That's one of the reasons why he'll win his eighth consecutive gold glove. He also had nine pickoffs. You can't rest easy at first, second, or third. He'll fire on you. 2-0 to Knobloch. Well, Knobloch has been swinging the bat very well lately. He's been more patient at the plate. He's a very good high ball hitter, so you have to make sure you stay down, and that's what Seeley's trying to do here. Three and out of the Yankee leadoff man. Will hit 292 for the year. High for ball four. Knobloch wasn't certain. On four pitches, he walks to start the Yankee first. Well, the one thing you can't do if you're the Texas Rangers is help the, the Yankees. You cannot base runners without them getting base hits. You have to make them earn everything that they're going to get. And you can see a little frustration there on Johnny Oates' face. If a guy gets a base hit, it doesn't bother him. But just do not walk hitters to give them a chance to come around and score runs. Cheater to the plate, O'Neill on deck. He still hasn't thrown a strike. Rodriguez out to talk with him. If you hear any rap on Ivan Rodriguez, some say he is not a great handler of pitchers, which is different from defensive skill. Well, I guess they have to find something wrong with him. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd be perfect. I, I think he's just a great catcher. Seeley has his sign. And the 1-0 pitch. 2-0. Aaron Seeley is 29 years old. 6'5", 220. Former Red Sox. Never did as well with them as he has the past two years with Texas. He was an All-Star in 98. And he's second in total victories the last two years in the American League. Second only to Pedro Martinez. Fouled off, and that's the first strike that Seeley has thrown if it was a strike. Just missed being a 20-game winner in 98. Came back to win 18 this year. Four and seven lifetime against the Yankees. One and oh this year. Beat Roger Clemens at Yankee Stadium in June. Seeley was the loser. In the series clincher for the Yankees game three at Arlington last year. That was the game that could have been played with an arc on the field. Three and a half hour rain delay. Cone and the Yankees closed them out for nothing. Two and two. Well, the one thing I'm noticing about Seeley, he has a lot of movement on his fastball. He's not throwing a straight fastball, so he's getting movement. And the one thing you have to always be aware of is he has a great curveball. We have not seen it so far in this game because he was behind every hitter, but he has a great curveball. The 2 2 pitch. Did Jeter lay off? He tipped it back into the glove of Rodriguez. Attempted check swing. But he made contact with it, and Rodriguez held it. Well, he went with the high fastball. Jeter tries to check. But he gets a foul tip, and it's strike three as it's held on to by the catcher, Ivan Rodriguez.
I don't know whether Jeter is more displeased with the call or with his at bat. Well, I think he figured he had one good pitch to hit. Two balls and one strike was a good pitch to hit, and he fouled it back. O'Neill hit 285, 19 homers, 110 runs driven in. 0 and 1 as a manager. Joe Torre let him manage the last game of the year at Tampa Bay, and he lost 6 2. Maybe he'll follow in the footsteps of another fiery Yankee right fielder, Lou Pinella, into the managerial ranks. Ball one to him. He's playing with a bruised right side, but he says he's close to 100%. He ran into the low barrier in foul ground in Tampa Bay over the weekend. Strike. And there's a the great curveball he has. And you have to use your curveball. You cannot just stand here and throw a lot of fastballs to these Yankee hitters. Here's the curveball. And look at the location. Right on the outside corner. As I recall, O'Neill took a Sealy curveball the opposite way for a home run in the game three win in the division series last October. Rolled foul, one and two. The difference, scouts say between Sealy with the Red Sox when he was a more tentative pitcher and now is that he used to use the curve to set up the fastball. Now he's using the fastball to set up the curve. Well, what he did before, anytime he got in trouble, you knew that he was going to go to the curveball. And there are a lot of hitters in the major leagues who can hit the curveball when it's a strike. But what you do if you can get ahead with the fastball and then you can get him to chase the breaking ball when it starts in the strike zone and breaks out of the zone. One two pitch up and in two and two now block at first has swiped 28 bases and he's been caught nine times Like Hernandez working very deliberately. There goes Knobloch. And a drive to center. Back goes Goodwin. Almost to the track to take it. And retreating to first is Knobloch with two down. Well, he got the fastball in just enough that O'Neill couldn't drive it out of center field. Watch where the pitch in is up a little bit and in on the hands. Right there, he doesn't get to it. And he knows right there that he didn't get it. Take a look and we'll see this pitch in on the fist on the inside part of the plate. And he jammed it. So that'll leave it up to Bernie Williams. The batting champion a year ago at 339. Hiked it three points to 342, but finished third behind Garcia Para and Jeter. Bob Knobloch was running on the pitch, and I think he was running because he expected a curveball to be thrown to O'Neill, and he's trying to pick his spots like that. If you can figure out when he's going to throw a curveball, you have a chance of stealing even on Yvonne Rodriguez. Fastball high. In the offseason, the Rangers, who are one of the more free-spending teams in the majors, pursued Roger Clemens and especially Randy Johnson, hoping to come up with a true ace to start a series like this. No disrespect intended towards Sealy, a very capable pitcher at 18 and 9, but not an ace in the sense of a Pedro Martinez at Johnson or the Clemens of old. There are not many of those anywhere, but I think one reason they wanted Randy Johnson as well is because you like to throw left handers against this Yankee ball club. And it's ironic that Texas doesn't have a left hander to start, and neither does Cleveland. So it could be interesting. There's Roger Clemens. Slated to start game three in Texas. Sealy works one and one. Hits softly into center. Goodwin racing in. Gets there. Nice tumbling catch by Tom Goodwin to conclude the Yankee first. No score after one in the Bronx. 
Our aerial views are courtesy of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Overhead, Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes, based in Pompano Beach, Florida. They started up here from Pompano Beach just after the All-Star Game and arrived moments before game time. This inning in in catch by Goodwin was tougher than it appeared because the ball was hit off the end of the bat. Bernie Williams took a big swing, and a lot of times a guy will break back because the hitter takes a big swing, but he got a great jump on it, and he comes in and makes the tumbling catch. When a hitter takes a big swing, the first inclination is to start back, but he hit that off the end of the bat, and he got a great Number jump nine, on it. Nick Bottom of the order. In the top of the second, Stevens, Clayton, and Goodwin. A couple of things changed for Lee Stevens this year. He was going to platoon at DH with the right-handed hitting Mike Sims. Sims got hurt before the season started. Fouled away for strike one. He thought he'd be the DH. Instead, he wound up playing first base for the most part with Palmero DHing because of a balky knee. And Stevens, who had never hit left-handers well, hit over 300 against Southpaws this year and was an unsung hero in all departments for the Rangers. El Duque moves him away, a ball and a strike. This is the thing I think El Duque has to settle down, make sure that he has all his pitches working, and just try to establish that he's in control out there on the mound. In the air, down the left field line, coming over Ricky Lede, but it's in the seats. Watching El Duque work now out of a full windup with no one on base. He used to hear this said all the time. Stylish left-hander, stylish right-hander. Guys with distinctive motions. Warren Spahn, Juan Marichal, Luis Tian, Koufax, Palmer, Drysdale. Something kids could imitate the way they imitate a hitter's batting stance. Generally speaking, pitchers' motions are more compact these days. Split toward third, tricky hop for Brocious, but he takes care of Stevens. But El Duque isn't just good, he's fun to watch. Yes, he is fun to watch. Very athletic, great fielder. This is the pitch, as I said, what I think is the key for him. To be able to get the fastball in on the left-handed hitters. He cannot throw the off-speed breaking ball to the left-handed hitters and get them to chase it as he does the right-handed hitters. So to combat the left-handed hitters, he can come inside with the fastball, throw the changeup away. Royce Clayton to the plate. Fouls off strike one. The official story is that Orlando Hernandez will be 30 in a few days, October 11th. According to Roberto Gonzalez Echeverria, the Yale professor who wrote the definitive book about the history of Cuban baseball called The Pride of Havana, El Duque is actually 34, or will be. Well, the question is, you're going to believe El Duque or somebody else? that wrote the book. In this case, I'm inclined to believe somebody else. And, and by the way, Echeverria is totally sympathetic to El Duque and others like him who had, in effect, their youth taken away by the system in Cuba and their earning power taken away. Why not shave a few years off if you can get, get away with it and extend your career now that you're making some dough in the U.S.? Two and one, the count. I guess I always know the day my mom told me I was born. In the air to shallow right, down the line, may not be playable, and it's in the seats. Now, you never checked the birth certificate. You just took your mom's word for it, right? Well, I have seen the birth certificate, but I would take her word yeah. first, yes. And I'm sure that's what El Duque did. You know, and generally speaking, when you're four or five years old and you look in the mirror, you're not telling yourself, they tell me I'm four or five, but I look like I'm 11. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> One out, nobody on. Leighton with 288 this year with 14 homers, awaits a 2-2 pitch. Swings and misses the third strikeout of the game for El Duque. And what he's been able to do against the right-handed hitters after he got Gonzalez to chase the breaking ball in the dirt is that he gets them looking for the off-speed pitch and he's been able to throw the fastball by them. He did the same thing to Todd Zeal and he does it here again to Royce Clayton. 
They're sitting on the breaking ball because that's the toughest pitch for them to handle. And before you know it, he's throwing the fastball by you. The fans keep track, and Goodwin stands in, taking ball one. A natural leadoff hitter whose on-base percentage has plummeted, so they slip him down to number nine, which a lot of American League managers regard as a second leadoff spot anyway. In on his fists, a soft fly to center, and in contrast to the first, when the Rangers loaded the bases without scoring, they go in order against El Duque in the second. Joe, as you mentioned, a year ago, Texas actually pitched well against the Yankees and lost the three division series games 2-0, 3-1, and 4-0. Johnny Oates sent Todd Stottlemyre to the mound against David Wells in game one. Stottlemyre pitched well on the short end of the 2-0 score. Then he left and went to Arizona as a free agent. And as we noted, they were unable to acquire a big-name free agent pitcher on their own, such as a Clemens or a Johnson. So now it falls to Aaron Seeley in game one, Rick Helling game two, and Loiza will pitch game three. Hard to imagine a lineup as potent as Texas's, even though they didn't have Palmero a year ago, hitting 141, even in a short three-game stretch. Curve for a strike to Tino Martinez. Martinez really feasted on Ranger pitching this year. 396 against Texas with six home runs. Another curve drops in at the knees. Beauty. And those are two different pitches, Bob. He started one on the inside part of the plate. Now he backdoors it with the curveball, starts it off the plate outside, and hits the outside corner. A third curveball. This one is fouled in the dirt, and it got a piece of Rodriguez. And with two strikes, you can see what Rodriguez did. Watch Rodriguez. He puts his glove all the way on the ground. Watch it. He tells him he wants it down. And he throws it down. And that's what you want to do when you're ahead in the count. Even bounce the curveball and see if you can get him to chase it. Martinez got a piece of that. And a fastball slice foul. Aaron Seeley's wife, Jennifer, is at home in Seattle watching this one on television, expecting their first child any day now. Aaron's thoughts, obviously, with her. Another 0-2 pitch. Hit hard. A leadoff single for Martinez. You can go in depth on every game of baseball's postseason by logging on to MSNBCSports.com. Comprehensive total casts, pitch by pitch updates, real time box scores, an interactive look at each of the division series, complete with player matchups. And you can vote online for which teams you feel will advance in the postseason. MSNBCSports.com, the official website of NBC Sports. Huge ovation for Daryl Strawberry. He had only 49 at-bats after returning from a variety of problems. And Joe Torre said it was a very difficult decision for him to make to sit Chili Davis and give Daryl Strawberry the opportunity to play. But he needed that presence of a big bat in the lineup. Just his presence causes problems for the opposing pitcher. Chili's 1-0 pitch is in there. You can see he's still feared. He got 17 walks, 49 official at-bats, 17 walks. He's still a presence. There's Chili Davis, and Joe Torre said both of them made it difficult for him because they both said, whatever you want to do, Skip. Sealy with real command. And that, a shaky that, start in the first, but he settled in. That's a very difficult pitch for a left-hander to handle. The ball starts off the plate outside, and all of a sudden it catches the outside corner. You give up on it, and it clips the outside edge. Here's the one-two. A curveball rolled slowly to second. McLemore gets the force to Clayton. On to first, Strawberry beat it there. 
McLemore didn't handle the ball cleanly and he took a little longer to get the ball to Clayton than he really wanted to. Now watch. This is a double play situation, but see, he couldn't get out of his glove properly, then he gives him the underhand toss and a nice slide there at second base by Tino. And Darrell clearly safe at first base. So that'll bring up Posada. One difference between the Yankees of a year ago, who outscored their opponents by an almost ridiculous margin of 309 runs, and this year's team, which was a still impressive plus 169, but nothing like a year ago, is that the bottom third of the order, the 7, 8, and 9 spots, have not produced in 99 as they did in 98. Well, they scored 70 fewer runs this year. Had a dozen fewer home runs. I mean, they just they did not have the same type of numbers that they had last year. Even their earned run average was a third of a run higher. And as I mentioned earlier, they had 30 more unearned runs against them than they did the year before. 1-0 pitch, foul back. Posada though is still a dangerous hitter, especially in this ballpark from the left side. He's a switch hitter, but Joe Girardi gets a considerable number of the starts against left-handers. And Girardi will catch Pettit tomorrow night in game two. Actually, it's not tomorrow. There's an off night because of a strange scheduling to accommodate television in the division series. Game two won't be played until Thursday night here. One and two. And Seeley seems to be settling in, as did El Duque here in the second inning. If you watch the location of his pitches, watching Yvonne Rodriguez give him the target, and he's hitting the target. Strawberry a short lead at first. Posada lofts one to left. Greer over toward the line. And right on the chalk, he makes the catch. Two down. Another good pitch, a backdoor curveball. Started off the plate and just came in over the outside corner. Not a lot that Posada can do with it. Watch the target that Yvonne Rodriguez gives. Look at the target. Now watch where this pitch would have ended up. Right on the target. Here's from behind the plate. This is the view Rodriguez gets. Right on the outside edge. And Posada hits the fly ball to left field. That's really spotting the curveball well. Normally with a curveball, you just try to throw a strike with it. But Seeley is moving the curveball around, inside and outside. Now Ricky Lede with 276 with nine home runs, platooning in left field with Chad Curtis. But Lede is going to get all the work in this series because the Rangers have no lefty starters. So Curtis will come off the bench if he plays at all. Shane Spencer, who was such a sensation toward the end of last year, did not make the roster for this series. He could be at it if they get as far as the LCS. They go instead with utility man Clay Bellinger for the 25th spot. Strawberry's running, and the pitchers foul back to the screen. Well, what they're counting on here is Seeley getting lazy and not checking the runner at first base. And they feel like, hey, if I can get a great jump, then I'm going to be able to steal the base. Joe Torrey comes out and talks to the home plate umpire, Jim Joyce. I think what he's saying is that Rodriguez is reaching out too soon and not waiting for the ball as we see Darrell slide into second base. Rodriguez always goes forward to catch the ball, which allows him a better chance of throwing the runner out. And Joe Torrey's trying to say that he interfered with Ricky Lede's swing there. Seeley's ahead of him 0-2. And, and misses high and away. Speaking of Shane Spencer, remember last year, he was doing some kind of Joe Hardy act out of damn Yankees. There he is in uniform but not eligible in this series. He had 10 homers in his first 67 big league at-bats and then homered twice in the three games against Texas. He's come back to earth a bit this year. Eight homers in 205 at-bats. Former replacement player who made it to the big leagues after many years in the minors. 
and for a while was leading a charmed life. Brocious on deck if Lede reaches. Full count. Bob, you know, talking about Shane Spencer, pitchers make adjustments to you. They change what they, how you're pitching to you when you're hitting a lot of home runs. That's why it's so almost impossible to think what Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa did again this year because pitchers made a lot of adjustments, tried a lot of different things with them. Strawberry goes on the 3-2 pitch and he'll have to come back. Now say what you want about the explosion in offense and it has certainly gotten to the point where comparisons to even five, six years ago are impractical. When 45 players hit more than 30 home runs, something's out of whack, but nobody besides Sosa or McGuire hit more than 48 in either league, and these guys are up in the mid-60s for a second year in a row. Another 3-2 pitch. Line to left. Greer has to get past it, and Strawberry's going to come all the way around to score. Lede on his way to second. Straw scores. Lede stops with what has to be scored as a double, although Greer misplayed it in left. Well, Bobby clearly lost the ball in the light, and he was trying to get below the bank of light behind the, the Yankee dugout. This ball has smoked the left field, but now Greer gets there, but there are bank of lights behind the Yankees dugout. Now watch him, he will get down. See right there, he ducks his head because he lost sight of the ball. The lights got in his eyes and he lost the ball. Many a young player has been cowed by the bright lights of New York, in this case, <laughs> literally. Now watch, watch this line right now. Watch his head right there. He turns it away from the ball. He's not even looking to see where the ball is. He's just trying to protect himself. Now Broch is trying to add to the one nothing Yankee lead. A ball and a strike. A year ago, Broch has had the season of his life. He hit 300 with 19 homers, 98 RBIs, had a huge postseason. He was the World Series MVP. This year, the numbers have leveled off more than a bit. Sealy's 1-1 pitch. A called strike two. The Yankee GM Brian Cashman says, we got to give Scott a mulligan for this year. His dad, Maury, passed away in September. Died at age 55 of cancer and much of the year. Brocious was preoccupied with his struggle for life. In fact, leaving the team on occasion to be with him. The one-two hits sharply, but right at McLemore. The Yankees settle for one in the second. And after two at Yankee Stadium. New York one, Texas nothing. All of a sudden, he can't find the ball. You can see he definitely doesn't know where the ball is. He reaches for it, and then it goes by. Now, as he comes in the dugout, this is a touch of class as far as I'm concerned. Watch Aaron Seeley. Here's the guy that he cost the run, and he comes up and pats him on the back. Now, watch as he goes by. His teammates will say, hey, man, we understand. And you see guys coming up to him. And no one feels worse about it than Rusty Greer. And that's breaks of the game. Tough. Alabama, who plays the game hard, Rusty Greer. Breaking ball from El Duque is down and in to Mark McLemore, starting the third. But you can see the look at his face. Even though his teammates have patted him on the back, said it's okay. He knows how important it is for them to play well defensively and not to make any mistakes here. Center field, Bernie Williams, late break, but has time to close ground on it. When you're the underdog and you're in the home team's Park, you have to play flawlessly to beat a team like the Yankees. The Yankees are a very experienced and professional-like team. I mean, they go about their job in a professional way, so you cannot make mistakes or give them extra outs or give them runs, but, I mean, nothing he could do about that. The ball just got in the lights. We're now on deck. 
as Rodriguez bats with one out on the third. He doubled off the right field wall in his first at bat. Rodriguez 332 average was the highest by an American League catcher since the Yankees Bill Dickey in 1936. And he hit 374 after the All-Star break. This in addition to his unparalleled defensive prowess. A ball and a strike, so let me put this question to you. It almost seems like heresy, but is he as good as Johnny Bench? Well, I, I think defensively you'd have to say yes, he's in Bench's category, but remember Johnny Bench was a guy that led the league in RBIs, hit 45 home runs. I mean, he did a lot of things offensively that Rodriguez hasn't done yet, but when 45 homers and 120 or so RBIs meant something different than it does today. You're right. I mean, look at those numbers. I mean, he steals bases, plays defense, drives in runs, and hits for a high average. Can't ask for any more than that. The one-two from that sidearm angle, outside two and two. Ted Simmons, who is now a vice president with the San Diego Padres, but one of the outstanding catchers in the National League and later in the American League when he went to the Brewers before they switched back to the National League. Uh, Ted Simmons told me that Rodriguez's footwork is better than benches. Best he's seen, the quickest speed he's seen. Well, they were a little, they, their styles were a little different. A broken bat bloop into center, and Bernie Williams can't get there. So Rodriguez is two for two. Go ahead, Joe. Bench was a power catcher. I mean, he had a great throwing arm. And Rodriguez has a little more finesse behind the plate. Gets rid of the ball very quickly. Here's Rodriguez. Look at that. He keeps his front shoulder in. That's why he's such a good hitter. Everything he, every swing he takes, he's aiming everything towards right field. See how he goes into the ball? Everything's going towards right field. And he's able to flip one in the center field. But good hitters do that. Now Rusty Greer trying to atone for his misplay of a moment ago. Juan Gonzalez will be next. The 1-0 pitch is high. We'll see if Rodriguez tries to steal a base here. Hernandez gives you a little time to run. He will change his pitching motion every once in a while. He'll speed it up, but he still gives you a little time to run. Anytime a pitcher drops down to throw sidearm, it takes him a little longer to release the ball than it does a guy that's throwing from a three-quarters motion. Two balls and a strike to Rusty Greer. Rodriguez at first, uncommonly fast for a catcher, stole 25, and was caught 12 times. And if you would like, this is a perfect hit and run situation. Two balls, one strike. One out. And El Duque chases him back. Rodriguez goes. Here's Posada's throw. Rodriguez steals it. The ball skips into center. Rodriguez thinks better of trying to advance. Good job by Bernie Williams of backing up that play because otherwise he would have gone to third. But this is what Rodriguez can give you that other catchers can't. He gets a good jump, and the throw is not a good throw, but I'm not sure he would have had him anyway. You see he's in there before the ball gets there. But he jumps up, and he can't go any further because of Bernie Williams. Here's the throw by Posada. He throws it low, but you can see that Rodriguez was there, and he wisely holds up because Bernie Williams is right on top of the play. Now Hernandez behind in the count to Greer, three and one, and he steps off. So Rodriguez has doubled, singled, and stolen a base, and we're just in the top of the third. Greer walks for the second straight time. Coming up on NBC. NBC 
Sleepy Wednesday, when a terrorist attacks, the president strikes back. We come back with total disaster. The West Wing Wednesday. That's what you want, a chief executive who's a man of decisive action. West Wing, a new addition to the NBC lineup Wednesdays. Hernandez has walked three, struck out three. Gonzalez could get the Rangers three with one swing. Two on, one out. Off-speed breaking pitch and a beauty for strike one. Juan Gonzalez uses the entire field, but he has more power to left field, of course, because he's such a strong hitter, but he can't hit the ball out in any direction. It doesn't get any easier. Palmero waits on deck. Gonzalez struck out swinging with two men on in the first. A ball and a strike. Earlier today, Houston got the jump. On the Braves, Reynolds beat Maddox, 6-1. Caminiti had a homer. They go up 1-0 in the series. Later tonight in Arizona, the Mets survived a wild final weekend in the one-game playoff with Cincinnati, open against Randy Johnson and the Diamondbacks. There's the final from Turner Field. And if you're the Houston Astros, you, like to, you probably feel like you got a monkey off your back. Greg Maddox and the Braves have beaten them continuously in the playoffs in the past. A ball and two strikes. We've made two great pitches on Gonzalez. He has hit the outside edge with sliders, off-speed sliders. The way he can change speeds, and he comes at you with that motion and those arm angles, if you're a right-handed hitter, even a great one like Gonzalez, this guy's a handful. Two. In the air to right center field, Bernie Williams sprinting over on the move. Rodriguez tags and moves to third. Bob by Williams, and Texas now has runners at the corners with two out for Palmero. And that was a great play by Bernie Williams. When this ball was first hit, I thought it was in the gap. Williams gets a great jump on it, and he what he does perfectly here as he cuts the angle off. He didn't circle it, and he gets there, and he makes the catch. I mean, you can see that he's going all out. I'm going to catch this baseball. He wasn't even worried about where Paul O'Neill was. He made up his mind he was going to make the catch, and he did. So now Palmero, who walked in the first, Gold Glove winner as a first baseman each of the last two seasons. But the DH, because of a bad knee, with Stevens doing most of the work at first in 99. Another chance for Williams. Going back. Ball carrying, but not far enough. He'll take it to end it. The Rangers threaten, but don't score. They leave two and still trail 1-0. And so forth, a lot of the things that you said. Were you intentionally funny, or did it just come out? It just came out to me. I, I really don't know. I said them all. I really didn't. It just comes out to me. That's it. Yogi, great to see everybody's happy, all Yankee fans and baseball fans, to see you back in the stadium. All right, thank you very much. Bob, back to you. And Chuck Knobloch spanks one to left for a leadoff hit in the Yankee third. That was a pretty good curveball from Seeley, and Knobloch just went down and got it and ripped it to left field for a base hit. Now watch the location. It's down, which is what you want with a curveball. Look at that. I mean, that's a pretty good pitch. Uh, and you have to give him credit. This is good hitting. Here's a breaking ball. And he rips it to left field. Great to see Yogi, though. Yes, it is. I mean, Yogi's one of my special friends. We go away and play golf together in the winter. Now the Yankees lost Joe DiMaggio and Catfish Hunter this year, but they welcomed Yogi back after a 14-year estrangement. He and Mr. Steinbrenner patched it up. 
I don't think Yogi has to wonder. He's going to make that all-century team. According to the balloting I've seen, he finishes second in the fan voting for the all-century team at the catcher spot behind Johnny Bench, your old teammate. They'll make the official announcement in a few days and introduce the team at the World Series. Strike one to Jeter, who struck out in the first. The Yankees have put the leadoff man on in all three innings so far. Speaking of DiMaggio, the number five, of course, is in honor of the late Yankee Clipper. Rodriguez bluffs the throw, but Knobloch well aware that half the time he isn't bluffing. He's picked off nine runners this year. And when a right-handed hitter up there and the ball's toward the outside corner, he's almost in throwing position before he catches the ball. That's that footwork Ted Simmons was talking about. He does have great footwork. Sealy's 0-2 pitch to Jeter. He reaches for it, rolls it slowly and foul towards Zio. Baseball tomorrow. ESPN has game two, Astros Braves. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver open up at Jacobs Field, Red Sox and Indians. Let's see how Cleveland can handle Pedro Martinez, who's 4-0 against them lifetime, and just about unhittable down the stretch. And back to ESPN for Mets and Diamondbacks. Game two tomorrow night. Not only is Martinez 23-4, but he has a closing kick this year, reminiscent of Oral Hershiser in 1988. Going into the postseason, just about unhittable. Still 0-2. One thing I've noticed, Sealy is making a lot of quality pitches, Bob, but he, he's not able to put the hitters away. I mean, he only has one strikeout, and he has such a great curveball, you would think that he would be able to strike out more hitters than he's striking out in this ballgame. He's got ahead of the hitters, but he's not able to put them away. He's ahead of Jeter, 0-2, and he hasn't been able to just finish him off. And you let a hitter get a look at four or five extra pitches, and he... Curveball swung on and missed. That's the second strikeout, and both times, Jeter was the victim. And that's what I'm expressing. He should be able to change speeds on his curveball and get more strikeouts. Fastball on the outside corner for a strike. Another fastball on the corner for strike two. Good curveball. Jeter spoils it. Fastball he fouls away, and here's that great curveball. That's the pitch that I say that he should have more strikeouts with simply because there's such a sharp downward break on it and he changes speeds on it so well. But he's only been able to strike Jeter out with it so far in this ballgame. Now O'Neill who fly the deep center of the first. O'Neill is 36 years old. Since coming over from the Reds, he's been an important part of contending teams and world championship teams with the Yankees. But at age 36, he may not have many more seasons remaining as the Yankees' starting right fielder. This is a team, obviously, with money to spend. And there's talk of Sean Green, the terrific young outfielder for the Blue Jays, who becomes a free agent after next season, and that the Yankees might be interested in him. The 1-0 pitch. Two balls and no strikes. This is the first year that O'Neill has not hit 300 since he came to the Yankees. But he still drove in 100 runs, so he's still a very productive outfielder, but I understand your point. He's probably seen his best years. He closed with a rush. 31 RBIs for Joe Torre in the month of September. Block inching away from first, and Sealy's 2-0 pitch. This is high. Bernie Williams awaiting his turn, and Tino Martinez would follow him. But don't be surprised if Joe Torre doesn't let Paul O'Neill hit 3-0 here. Paul O'Neill is a master at working himself into a hitter's count. And he has done that here in the bottom of the third inning.
You'll never know. The fastball is high and away. Walks him on four pitches. Second walk issued by Sealing. Johnny Oates said before this series began, we have a much better chance this year. They're still good, but nothing like a year ago. They won 16 fewer games. But still, they won 8 of 12 head-to-head -head against Oates' team this year. Including a 21-3 humiliation of the Rangers in Arlington in August. A ball to Williams. And they always have that experience factor. They know how to win and play in big games. Plus, coming to Yankee Stadium, especially in the postseason, is no picnic for visitors. The atmosphere here can be more than raucous. It can be brutal. In there, one and one. Denny Hawking is now with the Twins, well-traveled veteran. Was quoted as saying, you come to Yankee Stadium, you see a dozen seven-year-olds flipping you the bird. It makes you wonder about the youth of America. Those are the words of Denny Hawking, who can be reached in care of the Minnesota Twins, rather than 30 Rockefeller Plaza, headquarters of NBC. Both Seeley and Hernandez are slow workers, especially with runners on. Here's the 1-1. Williams bounces it towards Stevens, looks at second, takes the shoe out at first, second and third, two out, and Martinez headed for the plate. And one of the things that happened there, Stevens wanted to go to second base, but Paul O'Neill ran in the same direction, stood up, did not go down and look like he was going to slide, and didn't give Stevens an angle to throw to second base. Here's Dick Bosman, the pitching coach, visiting the mound. Now watch this play. Stevens wants to go to second base. See, Paul O'Neill doesn't get a great start. But when he looks down there, all he can see is Paul O'Neill's back, so he decides I better take the sure out at first base. And here's O'Neill. He's right between Stevens and Royce Clayton. So it's Tino Martinez as Bosman returns to the dugout. First base open, two out. Martinez grounded a single to right and is only at bat. With the exception of last year's World Series against San Diego, Martinez, who has been in the postseason every year since 1995, has never been a good playoff or World Series hitter. He had the big grand slam off Mark Langston in game one of the fall classic in 98. But generally speaking, he has struggled in the playoffs. Here's the 0-1. And a lot of people may be wondering, well, why wouldn't you walk Tino Martinez? Because he did get a base hit his first time up. Well, the reason you do not walk him is, first of all, you put you load the bases, then you give Aaron Seeley less margin for error when he's pitching to Daryl Strawberry. What you do here is try to make tough pitches to Martinez, and if he swings at him, okay. If he doesn't, and you end up walking him, you're still in pretty good shape. Bounces the curveball up there. Nice play by Rodriguez. We mentioned earlier, here's a guy who catches nearly every day. One pass ball. One. But he also gives you the luxury, if you're a pitcher, to be able to throw your best pitch in this situation with a runner at third base. You know that he's going to block the pitch. A lot of times with catchers, they, that takes away their sharp breaking curveball or their slider in the dirt. That doesn't happen when you have a guy like Rodriguez behind the plate. Yeah, it isn't just the pass ball's charge. It's the wild pitches prevented. Correct. 
For example, that one certainly wouldn't have been a pass ball. The pitch a moment ago, he prevented a wild pitch. Two and two. Slowly towards short, Clayton fires to Stevens to retire Martinez, and the Yankees leave two. After three, Yankees still lead it one zip. On the right is the president of the Sydney Olympic Organizing Committee, Michael Knight, seated with NBC's Dick Ebersol and explaining to him why baseball is fine, but not nearly as fascinating as cricket. You ever been to a cricket match, Joe? No, I think it lasts for days, though. I know days. <laughs> and every moment of it more confusing than the first. But maybe that's the way the Aussies feel about baseball. Although a few Australians have made it to the major leagues, including the former Yankee Graham Lloyd. Now with Toronto as part of the deal that brought Roger Clemens here. A deal that worked out well for the Blue Jays. Homer Bush played well for them at second. David Wells had a good year. And Graham Lloyd was his usual self, effective against left-handers. A ball and a strike to Todd Zeal, starting the Texas fourth against Orlando Hernandez. The Yankees lead it 1-0. Two and two. Todd Zeal probably just happy to spend a full season in one place, and a good place. The Rangers, the champions of the American League West. But he is among the majors most well-traveled players, often it seems, being traded just before the deadline to some contending team. Well, they always want his bat in their lineup. I mean, he's always been a pretty good hitter. As you mentioned, he started off as a catcher, and he didn't handle that position as well as they wanted, so he moved to another position. A drive to left center field, Bernie Williams sprinting back, along with Lede at the fence, and Ricky Lede, some 400 feet from home plate, makes the catch. That's one thing that the that Yankee Stadium affords you is they give you a place to pitch to. If you can keep the ball towards the big part of the ballpark, you can get the hitters out. I mean, this is a long fly ball. In a lot of ballparks, this is gone. But it's 399 right there in left center field. And Rick Lee Day is able to get back there and make the catch. When I was a kid coming to games at Yankee Stadium on the subway, it was 457 to left center. Then after the first remodeling, it was 430. So while 399 is still a long poke into the gap, it's much friendlier to hitters than it once was. It was over 460 to the monuments which were on the field in straightaway center back in those days. A liner down the right field line that's in there for a base hit for Lee Stevens. My mistake, it landed foul. foul ball and a near extra base hit for Lee Stevens. Well, he hits this off the end of the bat and it starts to hook right about now and just out of the reach of the fans and foul as Derwood Merle signals foul. So a ball and a strike to Stevens who grounded out his first time up. few hitters have hit the ball pretty hard against El Dique. Well, neither pitcher is establishing that he's in command out there on the mound. We've only had one one two three inning. That was El Duque in the bottom top of the second inning. They're throwing a lot of pitches. That one gets the corner two and two. Sealy trailing one nothing because of the ball misplayed and left by Rusty Greer. Yankees got their run in the second. Down goes Stevens. Fourth strikeout for Hernandez. 
This Sunday at 4 Eastern, NBC continues its coverage of the inaugural Gravity Games. Things got controversial in the stand-up skateboard in last week's show, with most competitors crashing into the hay bales. I hate when that happens. What'll happen this week when the even quicker street lugers tackle a treacherous course? The Gravity Games, Sunday at 4 Eastern, only on NBC. Have we done any color commentary on street luge, Joe? No, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> a succinct answer. <laughs> Clayton struck out in his only plate appearance. Hernandez throws the fastball by him upstairs. Andy Pettit will start game two on Thursday night here. If there is a game four in Texas, they'll give the ball to David Cohn. A weak wave at it, one and two. If there is a fourth game, Johnny Oates plans to come back with Aaron Seeley. Tonight's starter. There's the rotation as we understand it right now. Helling and Pettit in game two after a night off tomorrow. Clayton with a fly ball to center. Bernie Williams has it lined up. And Hernandez sets them down in order in the fourth. After three and a half, still 1-0 New York. Your blimps, stars and stripes. Did you currently maintain seven blimps, three domestic, four international operations? State Building, World Trade Center, and the DE Building, our headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. Darryl Strawberry takes strike one as he leads it off in the Yankee Ford. They're still buzzing about the shot Strawberry hit on Friday night. At Tropicana Field in Tampa, off the catwalk in right center field. A ball that many observers say would have gone better than 500 feet had it been unobstructed. Well, Joel Torrey takes it 100 feet farther. He said it would have gone 600 feet. He said it was going to be farther than the ball Reggie Jackson hit in Detroit in the All-Star game. And it brought comparisons to the roof shot that Strawberry hit in Montreal in 88, or the blast off the clock in the pennant race against the Cardinals at Bush Stadium off the Redbird left-hander Ken Daly in 85. He is still a feared presence at the plate. He lost a little pop back a short, and Royce Clayton is there to take it. And a good pitch there by Seeley. He had a three-and-one count, fastball count, and he threw him a slow curveball. And Strawberry was way out in front. So Straw is now 0 for 2. Seeley will work the Posada. The game is moving at a snail's pace. Each pitcher is deliberate. Each is worked deep into counts. And they're throwing a lot of pitches, Bob, but they're also able to make one good pitch to stay out of deep trouble. But they're throwing a lot of pitches tonight. As you see 67 for Hernandez and Seeley at 66. And we're just in the fourth. Aaron Seeley was 18 and 9 for the year. Prior to the All-Star game, he was 8 and 6, and his ERA was 5 and a half. Since then, he's won 10 of 13 decisions, and his ERA is a run and a half lower, right around four. You can go 18 and 9 these days with an ERA of 4.79. The league ERA in the American League is nearly five, 4.86. Here's the one-two. Floats outside. One of the great pitchers' performances of the year was Pedro Estacio in Colorado. He won 17 ball games and a, with a 5.06 earned run average, but that is great. I mean, pitching in a place like Colorado. In that ballpark, yeah. for sure.
2-2 pitch, slow roller right side. Stevens can't handle it. McLemore picks it up and shovels to Seeley for the out. Nice play by McLemore and Seeley. Seeley never stopped running, and McLemore backing up the play. Stevens got a real funny hop. He gets on the in-between hop. He probably should have just stayed back and waited for it. He do not have a fast runner in Posada. Now watch right here. Stay back. Let it bounce one more time. But he gets the in-between hop. Here comes McLemore. And he makes a nice play. The seldom seen 3-4-1. Yeah, 3-4-1. He gets an assist. Off the heel of his glove. Now McLemore continues on. And so does Seeley. They never gave up on the play. Chuck Merriweather called him out at first base. And now Ricky Lede, who has the game's only RBI. A liner to left that Rusty Greer lost in the lights as it sailed over his head. Seeley's fastball is only in the high 80s, but he can throw it by you if you're looking for the breaking ball, which he has established tonight. And his breaking ball is his best pitch. I mean, you have to be, if, when a guy has a great curveball as he has, you have to always be aware of it in the back of your mind. When the ball starts upstairs, you think it may break down, so you end up swinging at a lot of high fastballs out of the strike zone. As we head for the fifth, while there have been some balls hit sharply against El Duque, Ivan Rodriguez has the only two Texas base hits. The rest of the team is a combined 0 for 12. Tom Goodwin in the ninth slot to start it in the fifth. Called strike on the breaking ball. The Rangers have a center field prospect named Ruben Mateo, who sat out part of this year with a broken wrist. But he is said to be a legitimate five-tool player and may be ticketed to be their starting center fielder next season. Goodwin's the incumbent for now, 0-2. Johnny Oates recently had his contract extended, as did Doug Melvin, the general manager of the club. Why not? The results have been there. Despite the losses to the Yankees in the postseason, this is the third time in four years they've made the playoffs. And the other two times they played the Yankees, and they lost to the Yankees, but the Yankees went on to be world champions. So mm -hmm. you can't say that they were did not have a successful season. They just could not beat the world champions. Punch to short. Jeter to Martinez for the out. So now back to the top of the order for Mark McLemore, who's 0 for 2. The veteran second baseman has been bothered by bad knees the last couple of years, but he's feeling friskier now. He actually is in better shape physically than he was in 97 or 98. And he filled that spot for them at the top of the order when Goodwin's on base percentage plummeted and they had to move him down to the bottom. One of the things that makes El Duque tough is he throws from so many different angles, whether you're right-handed or left-handed. He started Goodwin off with an overhand curveball. Now he start, drops down and throws a sidearm fastball to McLemore, leading off this at bat. Hernandez is now retired six in a row. Out of that scissor kick windup, his 1-1 pitch misses. And this ball game begs for someone to take control because both of these pitchers, as I said, thrown lots of pitches. They struggle, but they have been able to come up with the big pitch when they've needed it. But you have to show some control out there. Show that you're in command. That'll give your team a boost. And El Duque's trying to do that. As you mentioned, he's had four straight hitters. He's retired. Well, more than that. Six. for time. 
And by both teams have had runners in scoring position, just have not been able to pick them up. Texas is 0 for 4, and New York is 0 for 3. In the air to right, Paul O'Neill over toward the line to take it for the second out. Now, Friday night, NBC comes back with Game 3 of the National League Division Series between the Diamondbacks and the Mets, which opens tonight in Arizona. So we don't have to get on a plane. Just camp in New York for the rest of the week and slide over to Shea on Friday. Speak for yourself. <laughs> now, what do you mean, we? <laughs> yeah, <It's> right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You're doing double duty. Yeah, I'll be in the, uh, Atlanta tomorrow. Oh, but it's that time of the year. You love it, right? I love it. You're right. I do. If they could just beam you up <laughs> from yeah. park to park, though, that it would be, be even better. Yes. Rodriguez, two for two. And smashes one to left, but Lede, almost in his tracks, takes it. So eight in a row retired now by Hernandez. Midway through, one nothing New York. Alongside Larry David, co-creator with Jerry Seinfeld of the Seinfeld Show, and Spike Lee, a rabid New York sports fan, as expected, in attendance. Brocious Knobloch Jeter in the fifth. Do you see the note? The other day, Billy Crystal yeah. bidding on one of the items in Barry Halper's auction of that incredible collection of baseball memorabilia of his spent $249,000 for one of Mickey Mantle's gloves. I saw it. I asked him if I gave him 10 grand, would he let me catch a fungo with it? Man, 249. I think my first glove actually cost $2.49 at Woolworths. Not more than that. Not much more, I'll tell you. Get a baseball glove when I was a kid for a good glove for 15 bucks. Yeah, 10 to 15. Of course, Mantle hadn't used it. <laughs> Zeal, who committed 25 errors this year, makes the play and throws Brocious out. The left side of the Ranger infield has been rather porous, both Clayton and Zeal, charged with 25 errors this year. And we talked about how good the New York Mets infield is. Alfonso and Ardonia has made nine errors between them. Well, here's Knobloch, a gold glove winner with the Twins in 97, who led Major League second baseman in errors this year with 26. As a former second baseman, how do you explain his decline? Well, he, he won a gold glove the year before he came to New York. And I don't understand it. I've never seen him have problems throwing until the last couple of years. Bang, bang plays. He has little trouble. But when he has time to think about it on a routine ground ball, he's liable to throw it away. It's weird. Not exactly the same as what happened to Steve Sachs years back with the Dodgers, but similar. Well, what was that Yogi Berra said? 90% of this game is mental, and the other 15% is physical. So I would say that it's more obviously a mental problem than anything else. When you have time to think about it, you think about the problems that you have, and you think, that, well, I can throw this away. Check swing foul, two and two. On a bang-bang play, on a double play, you just have to get it and get rid of it. That wound up in the Yankee dugout and got a piece of somebody. And obviously, we can't tell who just yet. We're told that it's Don Zimmer, the 68-year-old Yankee bench coach and Tory confidant, who is not as spry as he once was and couldn't get out of the way of that ball as it sliced into the dugout. It is definitely Zimmer. Bob, I'm amazed that this doesn't happen more often where you have stadiums where there's not a fence in front of the dugout because a lot of times, I mean, you do not, I don't care if you're 10 years old you, or 20 or whatever, you do not have time to get out of the way of the ball because you can only pick it up the last few feet. And you 
see the concern that Chuck Knobloch has on his face. As baseball fans know, as a player, Don Zimmer suffered a couple of serious beatings. The expression on Joe Torre's face speaks volumes. This is one of his closest friends. Obviously, our view is obscured as yours is, and we're not going to speculate about what might have happened, except we can confirm that the ball hit Don Zimmer. Zimmer has spoken about the possibility of retiring because his knees are aching him so badly that he's in constant pain. Holding an ice bag, it appears, to the side of his head. And he is conscious. That's a good sign. In the area behind his left ear. One of the most beloved figures in all of baseball, Don Zimmer. And you don't last that long if people do not like you. Just remember that. 51 years. 1949 was his first year of professional ball. There's a man who's dealt with his share of adversity. Death of his older brother Rocco, serious illness of his brother Frank. His own battle with prostate cancer. But he said it makes him really appreciate life a lot better now that he's gone through all these things and he realized that baseball is what it is, a game. It's not a life and death situation. Now Sealy back to work and missing inside the Knobloch full count. Jim Gray will get on top of the situation for us. Torrey with Stottlemyre. We'll get a report on Zimmer's condition as soon as we possibly can. Now the payoff. Bounce to the left side. It comes up nicely for Clayton, who throws Knobloch out. Two down on the New York fifth. And that'll bring up Jeter. That is, he was going back. Upset, not so much about making an out, but about what that check swing liner off his bat may have done to Don Zimmer. First one to Jeter, roll foul. He has struck out in his only two at bats against Sealy tonight. And the great thing about Derek Jeter, Bob, is he has improved each and every year. And that's what you like to see in a player. You're never satisfied with a great season that he had the year before. And he is the consummate team player. I mean, he only thinks about it about the team. He says he doesn't care about MVPs. He doesn't care about batting championships. All he cares about is the rings that he helps win with his ball club. He's got two of them already. So let me put you on the spot. Jeter, Garcia Parra. Alex Rodriguez, your choice. Just flip a coin. <laughs> I, I think it's very difficult. Depends on the team you're on. Depends on where you're playing. Alex Rodriguez, of course, has more power. Garcia Parra, perfect in Boston. Derek Jeter, perfect here. So, I mean, just a matter of where you're playing. The UN isn't far from here. He's got a job <laughs> waiting for you as a diplomat. Well, I mean, I don't know if you can choose between them. It's very difficult. Of course, Alex Rodriguez has more power than either one. You're talking about three guys almost certain. Even though it's early in their careers, this is a safe prediction. Barring injury or mishap, almost certain to make the Hall of Fame. I think that's the key, barring injuries. And Garcia Parra has had a few injuries back and getting hit. He's sitting out now. He's going to start tomorrow. He hasn't played for a few days. Alex Rodriguez this year had a knee injury. 
Derek has been pretty healthy this year. Shaley's 1-2 pitch to him. Fastball high and away. And I think the other problem with trying to choose Bob is I don't think any of them have reached their peak. They That's all seem to be getting it? better each year. What a thought for American League pitchers. Hit toward the middle and McLemore can't get to it. Jeter with a two-out single. And that's the reason he was able to hit 349 this year, Bob. He was behind in the count. And he hit so many balls to right field that McLemore has to shade him that way. But he fights it off until he gets a good pitch to hit. He fought off some tough pitcher's pitches. Now he gets a fastball pretty much in the middle of the plate. And he line, grounds it right back through the middle. And because he goes the other way, McLemore had him shaded toward right field. No chance to make a play. And when you're a guy that can fight off good pitches and then hammer the ones that they give you, that's why you can hit 349 and drive in 100 runs from the second spot position. That was New York's fourth hit. The Rangers have but two. Both of them from Ivan Rodriguez. A strike to O'Neill. He's fly to center and walk. We're only in the fifth, and this game is creeping up on two hours long already. And I underline creeping. Far different ball game than what I saw last night in Cincinnati with the Mets and the Reds. But everything starts on the mound, and last night Al Leiter was in complete control. And neither of these two pitchers tonight have been in complete control. They have been able to make quality pitches when they've needed to with runners in scoring position. Sealy's 0-1 pitch to O'Neill. Tapped foul at the plate. <laughs> you see Yvonne Rodriguez took his bare hand, tried to flip it in front of the plate, hoping that Jim Joyce wouldn't see that. Watch this. This is interesting. The ball. Now watch the ball in fair territory. He tries to bump it out there. Watch his right hand. Look at that. He just bumps it out <laughs> there. Tries to trick him, but Jim Joyce says, "No way." A wily move. Yeah. <laughs> if he picks it up, you know it's foul. But he bounces it out in front as if it's a fair baseball. Not only does he have quick feet, he's got quick hands. And a quick thinker. The 0-2. This is away. You told me last year after that controversial play at first base where Travis Bryman of the Indians had the ball strike him and Knobloch thought it was interference, that Johnny Bench was so quick and so accurate that he used to purposely throw a ball into the back of a guy who had bunted or squibbed one in front of the plate in order to get interference called and return a runner from, from first who was on his way to second back to first base. He did it quite often on bunt plays. That's when he did it mostly to move the runner back to first base. A chopper that is in the right field. Jeter on his way to third. They'll have no play on him. Runners at the corners with two out. Hernandez being able to make quality pitches when they're in trouble. This is not one of his better pitches. You have first base open. You do not want to give Paul O'Neill anything he can pull into that hole over there. You have a guy being held at first, and there's a breaking ball inside, and you'll see Stevens has no chance because he's holding Jeter on at first, and McLemore is shading him up the middle. Big hole on the right side. You try to keep the ball away, as he did the first two pitches. Shealy, who has thrown only two complete games in 33 starts, moving toward 100 pitches in the fifth. Fouled off by Williams, who has stranded three hitters and his two at three runners rather and his two at bats so far tonight. And in this inning is the first inning in the entire ball game where he's been hanging the curveball. He's been able to keep the curveball down, but we see no one throwing in the Texas bullpen. 
He's been able to keep the curveball down most of the night and as well as his fastball. But two pitches here, one to O'Neill and one here to Bernie Williams have been up in the strike zone. The whole idea for Texas all season long, with Jeter at third and O'Neill at first, has been to get through the sixth with a lead or at least staying close. They have a deep bullpen and then they try to get to Wetland to finish it. That one's in there 0-2. Well, there's the pitch that he's made a lot of hay on tonight. I mean, he's made some quality pitches with this backdoor curveball. And again, if most of the left-handed hitters are going to give up on it. See, it starts way outside, then it breaks right over the outside corner. Blocked by Rodriguez, a ball and two strikes. And I guarantee in the scouting report, they say if you get ahead of Bernie Williams, try to throw a breaking ball in the dirt, and he will chase it every once in a while. And that's what that was supposed to be. But again, you have to have confidence in your catcher with a runner at third to bounce the curveball as he did there. Rodriguez thought they had Williams struck out. So did Seeley. Jim Joyce's opinion is the one that counts, and he didn't agree. Well, you can watch Seeley's reaction. He starts this ball off the plate, and he thinks it breaks over the outside corner, and a Seeley starts off. And a pretty close pitch. Two out singles by Jeter and O'Neill put runners at first and third. Yankees trying to add to a one nothing lead in the fifth. And Seeley's 2-2 pitch. Full count. Well, he's thrown him a lot of breaking balls, so quite naturally you say, well, I should be able to sneak the fastball by him. But he tried that earlier in the ball game, and Bernie Williams is right on the fastball. Stevens plays behind O'Neill at first. He runs on the pitch, which is tapped foul. And I think that was a wise pitch. Come back with the curveball again and hope you can make a quality pitch with it. And this is a good pitch because it's really not a strike. You can see it breaking out of the strike zone, but with two strikes, Williams had to protect the plate. Pitch is going to break low. Another 3 2 pitch. A drive to center. Goodwin started in, now goes back. Off the face of the wall. Jeter scores. O'Neill scores. Williams pulls up at second with a double of a Yankee lead. Jumps to 3 0. Well, he decided to try to sneak the fastball by him, and he couldn't do it. He had thrown him a couple of quality curveballs. Williams spoiled them, but here he tries to throw a fastball by him, and Williams hammers it to center field. This is what happened in the first inning, although he didn't hit it out. He, he waited on the fastball and drilled it to center field over the head of Goodwin, and by the time they get it back in... Well, he's excited. The two-bagger... The Jeter reaction as he scores the first of the two that come home on the hit, which brings a chant of Bernie, Bernie from the Yankee Stadium crowd and brings Dick Bosman back to the mound. Benifro is the lefty, Crabtree the righty. I don't know if there is such a thing as a bad choice of pitches. Curveball, fastball. He was throwing a lot of curveballs to him, so he always figured to sneak a fastball by him, but he got the fastball up and out over the plate. First one to Martinez. Off speed and ball one. Tino is singled and grounded to short.
This will be Sealy's 103rd pitch. Two and up. Bob, last year so much was made of the fact that the Yankees didn't have an MVP, that they had 25 MVPs. Well, this year, two guys have stepped up. That's Derek Jeter and Bernie Williams, and they're the ones that have led the charge here in the fifth inning. They are definitely the two guys that have stepped up to become MVP candidates for this ball club. After falling behind on the count 2-0, they're not going to take any further chances with Martinez. They'll walk him intentionally. This is still a supremely balanced team. In a year where 45 major leaguers topped 30 home runs, Martinez led the Yankees with the same figure that led them in home runs a year ago, 28. They won 114 games last year without anybody hitting as many as 30 home runs and won 98 this year, same story. But they have definitely had two guys to step up and lead them this year. Strawberry is hit into a force play and popped to short. Zimmer back on the bench. That's good to see. <laughs> and the ever-present smile returns. The pitch to Straw. Gets away from Rodriguez. And the runners move up to second and third. Probably a wild pitch. Yes, but I'm not even I'm not so sure he wasn't crossed up on that pitch. Because Rodriguez, he doesn't go to block it. See? I'm not, I think he was crossed up. I think he was expecting something else. Because usually he gets down on that ball, even if he doesn't catch it, he's able to block it. But I believe he was expecting another type of pitch and didn't get it. And now they're gonna walk Daryl Strawberry. So a second successive intentional pass as we go to Jim Gray. All right, thank you, Bob. Well, Don Zimmer had a major laceration under his ear and in his jaw. Uh, they were able to patch him up. Uh, they took him back into the clubhouse, and Steve Donahue told us that he was uh, fine. And he asked him, could he sit up? He said, yeah, I can sit up, but I certainly don't want to dance. They asked him if he wanted to return to the bench. He said, give me a few minutes. And as you saw just a few moments ago, he came back out. Bob? Thank you, Jim. That is Steve Donahue, the trainer seated between Zim and Luis Soho, the backup infielder. How about that? Yeah, I can sit up, but I don't want to dance. <laughs> An irrepressible character, Don Zimmer. But if Sealy doesn't retire Posada, the flickering chances of the Rangers will be just about snuffed out. The Yankees are a base hit away from breaking this open. Ball one. Single by O'Neill. Double from Williams. Intentional walks to Martinez and Strawberry with a wild pitch in between. A line to the left. Rusty Greer has it. The Yankees score two and leave three. And after five, they lead Texas 3-0. of playoff baseball against the Yankees. The Texas Rangers have managed one run. Shut out twice in the three games last year in the division series, and they lost the middle game 3-1 to one and down 3 nothing as we enter the sixth in the opener of this series. He doesn't look like a man who's enjoying himself, does he? Well, they've had some opportunities tonight to score runs. They just have not been able to get the big hit in clutch situations. And now it seems that Hernandez has settled down. He's retired the last eight hitters in a row. Hernandez's history is that he gets stronger as the game moves along. Opponents batting average against him 
actually is lower from his 75th pitch on than it is at the beginning of the game. And he's right around 80 pitches now as he works in the sixth. The complete game is, of course, on baseball's endangered species list. Each of these staffs had but six for the whole year. And then, but, relatively speaking, Hernandez is a workhorse. He'll get you through the seventh. He pitched more than 200 innings this year. A high pop. Out around second, Jeter wants it. And that takes care of Rusty Greer. Division Series action continues tomorrow. Two games on ESPN with a game on Fox in the middle. Astros beat the Braves today 6-1. to one. They beat Greg Maddox in the process. Mets and Diamondbacks played their game one. And less than an hour from now, out at the Bob in Arizona. The Bank One ballpark. They call it the Bob out there. Have you ever been to Arizona? To the state of Arizona or yeah. to that ballpark? Well, I was thinking if you've been to the state, maybe they named it after you. <laughs> well, I am a reasonably well-traveled man, but <laughs> I can't accept the honor. Bank one ballpark. B.O.B. One and one to Gonzalez. Sliced foul. Each time he's come to the plate in this game against Hernandez, there were two men on. He struck out swinging in the first. Then he was robbed of a hit and of at least one RBI on a sliding catch in right center by Bernie Williams in the third. Two-time MVP, 96 and 98. With numbers this year that sound like an MVP, 326, 39, and 128. But it's a crowded field in 99. With those numbers, he doesn't even get a top five mention. Probably not. That's amazing. I mean, to have those types of numbers and have so many guys kind of ranked ahead of you. Look at those numbers. 326, 128, 39, 603 slugging percentage. All of those figures would likely have led the league with the possible exception of the 326, which would have been close a decade ago. Offense has exploded all around baseball. Two and two. Now here's one measure of that taken from the other side. El Duque's ERA is 4.12. That's actually in the top 10 in the American League. It's 10th in the league. Check the swing. They check it first. Chuck Merriweather says he didn't go around full count. Now that puts what Pedro Martinez did in right. perspective. His ERA was nearly two, and the league ERA is almost five. Nice check swing there. He was in complete control of the bat. And the 3-2 pitch. From the sidearm angle, he misses. And Gonzalez draws a walk. I'm not sure Gonzalez took that pitch because he thought it was a ball. I, I don't think he could hit it. That was a nasty pitch. And it snaps a string of nine consecutive Texas hitters retired. Well, he drops down, and you can see Gonzalez is already gone. But it is clearly off the plate. You know, the... the year that Pedro Martinez had, Bob, I mean, could arguably be one of the, be the best year ever, considering all the other facets where guys are driving in runs, scoring runs, and, you know, and being more difficult to pitch in today's situation. And he's pitching at Fenway Park right. in a DH league. Yeah. I mean, I think it rivals Bob Gibson's 1.12 iron run average when he had the, all the complete games and the shutouts, but it's a lot more difficult, I think, to pitch today and have those types of numbers. And to strike out over 300 and walk just 37? That's ridiculous. Two 
2-0 to Palmera, who has walked and flied to deep center. One thing with the Texas Rangers, they're always one swing from being back in the ball game. A line is speared by Martinez, a brilliant play, and he turns it into a double play. That ball was blistered by Palmero, but Martinez turns it into two outs and ends the inning. This was ticketed for right field corner, a double. Great catch there by Tino Martinez, and it's an easy double play. I mean, watch, he's up in front of the bag. Look how close he is to the hitter. He has to react very quickly. Leaps up, makes the catch. Now watch this reaction from both Orlando Hernandez and first Rafael. Rafael drops down, and Hernandez is saying, yes, we got him. So the Rangers, in need of a break, can't catch one. And Lede, whose double produced the game's first run, fouls it back. Bottom of the six, 3-6-0 New York, 0-2-0 Texas. New York try to beat the Rangers for the seventh consecutive time in postseason play and for the 30th time in their last 41 meetings. Lede, Brocious, and Knobloch in the sixth. Which could be Seeley's last inning, even if he breezes through it. Well, especially if you're Johnny Oates thinking about bringing him back in game four, if it gets that far. The 1-1. Hideaway, two balls and a strike. And that is Oates' intention. Then he'd have to decide if there is a game five, whether to use John Burkett, who hasn't pitched all that well of late, or to come back with his game two starter, Rick Helling. And Seeley has already thrown 116 pitches, Bob. And on three and one, he walks with A. They may not have the luxury of getting him through this inning. And this time it's Oates rather than Bosman, so you knew a change was in order. Exit Seeley, enter Crabtree, and we step aside for just a moment. Three-nothing Yankees, bottom of the sixth. Three-nothing score, and of course he's responsible for Lede, who's at first base, with nobody out on the bottom of the sixth as Tim Crabtree takes over. Crabtree, 6'4", 220, was 5-1 this year. Used in middle relief, his ERA was 3.46. His record is 11-2 over the last two seasons. He features that hard sinker. He's thrown four scoreless innings against the Yankees in postseason play, two appearances last year in the division series. Brocious is 0-2. for 2. Squares to bunt and sends it foul up the first baseline. This is one of the reasons the Yankees won so many ball games last year. When they get you down, they try to add on. They don't go for the jugular, so to speak, but they're just trying to get one more run here at home and go into the seventh inning with a four run or more lead. I think that's a great play there by Joe Torre to try to just get one more run. Willie Randolph, the coach who saw at third, flashing signs to Brocious. Jose Cardinal on the lines at first for the Yankees. Jim Gray told us before the game that Crabtree was one of the Rangers bitten by the flu bug. Looking to bunt again, pulls back and takes a strike, and now he's in an 0-2 hole. As a fellow second baseman, you can appreciate the career that guy yes. had. Now the Yankee third base coach, Willie Randolph. A winning player, a classy player. And a very intelligent player. I, th I, I think one of these days he's going to be a manager in the major league. Soon. Crabtree's 0-2 pitch, and Brocious fouls it back. Brocious had four 
postseason home runs in 98. Bob Brocious is the kind of guy, if he can work you into a hitter's count where it's 0 and 1, you know, that one ball, no strikes, 2 and 1, and you give him the fastball, he does not miss it. But if you can stay ahead of the count, you can handle him pretty easily. Looking to bunt on the 0-2 pitch, and he gets it down. Stevens fields it. McLemore covers. And a two-strike sacrifice bunt executed by Brocious. And I tell you what, that was a very good heads-up defensive play by the Texas Rangers. You do not expect the guy who had drove in 98 runs last year to bunt with two strikes. He squares around, drops it down. Great bunt there. And, and you can see Crabtree was not going to be able to get over there. But a good play there by McLemore. And Stevens, see everyone is caught a little bit off guard, but they react very quickly, and Stevens is able to get the ball to McLemore in time to retire Brocious. Good heads up play defensively by the Rangers. Which brings up Knobloch, who's one for two with a walk. Now that's very unusual to see a hitter. You see that a lot of times with a pitcher or maybe an eighth place hitter in the National League, but not a guy like Brocious who can hit the ball out of the ballpark bunting with two strikes. Yankees signed him to a multi-year deal during the winter and traded the highly regarded third base prospect Mike Lowell to the Marlins. Got the inside edge, one and one. Maybe, maybe he missed the sign. Because they're all talking about it. Has to be, because yeah. he can't be upset no, with no, what no he one. did. He did well, it no perfectly. One, no one's upset. I think maybe he missed the sign. Maybe it he turned thought out the, all right. He thought the butt was still on. Fouled off, one and two. That's Chris Shamless, who won a pennant for the Yankees. With a game five homer back when the LCS was just the best of five against the Royals in 76. And they're having off a wild scene in this ballpark. And they're having a good laugh, Bob, because I think they said, well, we didn't put it on, but we, we're glad you did the job. A day away from second, Crabtree checks him and brings the one-two home. Two balls and two strikes to Nabla. We have an excellent chance without extra innings for this game to reach midnight. Oates and Bosman. El Duque and Posada. Posada catches every game El Duque pitches. Taking care of the language barrier. Knobloch goes down on strikes. And check out an all new ER. NBC Thursday on ER. This is serious, Mark. A life and death decision affects a doctor's career. You do this or I go. All new ER Thursday. ER, part of Must See TV Thursday. So now it's up to Jeter with two out. Struck out twice, then singled and scored. Ball one from Crabtree. I can't help it, Joe. I see someone named Crabtree. All I can think of is the little rascal's teacher. <laughs> Remember Spanky and Stymie? They all loved her. Oh, Miss Crabtree. So much for that bizarre stream of consciousness. 2-0. Oh. strike. 
at two and one. And Jeter asked Jim Joyce, what's the pitch outside? And Jim Joyce shakes his head, no. It was over the outside corner. And the two one. Fouled off. Then a throw the lefty was throwing. Now he's standing and watching, but they've got him at the ready. If Crabtree doesn't retire Jeter and the left-handed hitter O'Neill comes up. And finally, the 2-2 pitch. Full count. Many adjectives could be used to describe this game. Brisk is not among them. And the 3-2 pitch. We'll do it again. Joe Torre told us before the game that there was more pressure on him and on the Yankees entering the 98 postseason because they had done so well, they were on the verge of something historic, and it all would have been forgotten or disparaged in some way if they hadn't finished it off by going all the way and winning the World Series. And in fact, they blitzed through the postseason 11-2. and two. This year, they feel they still have an excellent chance to be world champions again, but they don't feel as if it's as expected of them. Well, they don't have the same amount of pressure. Another 3-2 pitch from Crabtree to Jeter. Walked him. There's always pressure to win a pennant or to win a world championship, but it's just not as much pressure put on this team now as there was last year at the same time. Right, Crabtree no. leaves. Benefro, the lefty, comes on to face O'Neill. We're still in the sixth. Shots from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes, courtesy of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Rookie left-hander Michael Venafro has come on. He pitched very well in September for Johnny Oates and Dick Bosman. In 10 September innings, his ERA was 1.80. But the Yankees have treated him rudely in four appearances. They've scored six runs off him in six and two-thirds. That's an ERA upwards of eight against New York. Short stint for Crabtree. Seeley hoping his fate is not sealed tonight and that the Rangers can rally. O'Neill with two on and two out. The Rangers can stay close. They're always in the ballgame. They can put numbers on the board. Roll foul, just foul. That would have scored at least one and maybe more. O'Neill gets a fastball up and out over the plate. He's late on it, but just barely. Very unusual delivery for a left-hander from Venefra. Sidearm almost submarine. No one pitch to O'Neill. Fouled off. Ball is fly to deep center, walked and single. O'Neill hit 285 overall, but only 190 against lefties this year. And that's very unusual. He had been able to handle left-handers well the last few years. And that's the reason he didn't hit 300 here for the first time since he's been a Yankee. He lays off, and it's one and two. That's a good pitch, 0-2 oh pitch there by Benefro. 
You try to get him to chase something off the plate. If he doesn't go, it doesn't matter. Now it's one ball and two strikes. Benifro, a relatively little guy by today's standards for pitchers, 5'10", 180. Hardly ever see a pitcher under six feet tall these days. One, two pitch. Slash toward third. It's 4 nothing New York. Diving into third is Jeter. Lede comes across with the run that makes it a four-run New York advantage. Seal made 25 errors this year, and that one ate him up. Well, this breaking ball's in the middle of the plate. Now, watch, he tries to get his body in front of it instead of backhanding it, and he gets away from it. That's a very tough play because the ball's on him right away. I think he had a better chance of backhanding this ball. See how he tries to get his glove over in front of it. You have a better chance of backhanding that ball, maybe knocking it down. It was a very difficult play because the ball was hit very sharply down the third base. E5, and it's 4-0 New York. That's a tough error right there. Now Bernie Williams, whose long double back in the fifth scored two. Switch hitter turning around about right-handed. Peter at third. O'Neill at first. So here are the Rangers trying to get over that psychological hurdle. Losers of six straight playoff games to the Yankees. 29 of the last 40. And in the last 33 innings of postseason play, Johnny Oates' team has scored exactly one run and now trailing 4-0 in the opener. And only a few innings away from looking at Mariano Rivera if Torrey needs him. Paul strike, 2-1. they don't do not lose their confidence texas is always in the ball game i mean they are definitely capable of putting up four or more runs in the next two innings williams waits on the two one pitch and here it comes in the air to right this ball is on its way this ball is chance to hit from the right side nearly as much now. He's become a much better hitter from the left side. Curtain call for Williams, who was 0 for 11 against Texas in last year's playoffs. Yankees swept anyway. But tonight, he begins the series with five RBIs. Two-run double, three-run homer. And last year, Derek Jeter was one for nine against Texas. And he has been on base a couple of times with a base hit and a base on ball. Called strike to Martinez. Even for a right-handed hitter, in this case a switch hitter from the right side, Williams, that fortune right can still be inviting. Well, he has never been a pull hitter from the right side anyway, so he can take advantage of that short right field fence. This one's popped up on the infield. Stevens puts an end to the New York sixth. But far too late from the Rangers' perspective. The Yankees score four and lead it 7-0, headed 4-7.
full as the Yankees. You can't give them extra outs. You can't give them extra opportunities. Four unearned runs on one hit in the inning. Just the Williams home run. And on top of that, you're not putting any pressure on them by have, making them have to come from behind ever in a ball game. Texas has never been ahead of the Yankees in the last six games that they have played. And that really hurts. I mean, you don't. we don't know if the Yankees can come behind. At least Texas doesn't know it. They have not been able to put in any pressure on the Yankees. The Yankees have had everything going their way for the la in the last two series. It's almost astonishing yes. that a team as power-laden as the Rangers has been so thoroughly throttled by the Yankees in seven consecutive postseason games. Especially the last four in 98 and 99. And Bob, if you take a look at tonight's action, Yvonne Rodriguez is two for three. The rest of the ball club is 0 for 16. Look at those numbers, 0 for 16. So now El Duque staked to a 7-0 lead. And he was actually starting to throw the ball better anyway. Zeal pops one into shallow right. Not blocked back, O'Neal in. It should be O'Neal's ball, and it is. Duque would be the Yankees game five starter if there is a fifth game. Does that figure into how quickly Torrey ends his evening tonight? I think the only way it figures in, Bob, is if he continues to throw well here in the seventh inning, you may decide, well, he's throwing well, he's found his rhythm, now it's okay to take him out of the ball game. And I think he has found his rhythm. I mean, he's been pitching well since the third inning. Mel Stottlemyre he has the counter in his hand so he knows that he's thrown 95 pitches quickly ahead of Stevens 0-2 and you can see a little different approach by Hernandez he's throwing fastball fastball trying to get ahead and he is getting ahead when you have a seven run lead it takes seven solo homers to tie you so you want to make sure that that's the way they earn them they have to hit the ball out of the ballpark you're not going to walk anybody in El Duque's eyes. This is a competitor. And he can see the goal line right yeah. now. <laughs> no question. Change up. The way baseball is played these days, even with a performance like this, he's probably not going to finish it. Even with the shutout going, there's a chance that he'll come out and they'll let the bullpen complete it. Well, not, I believe, not Rivera tonight, but somebody else. I believe there are a lot of things you think about at this stage if you're Joe Torre. Because this is a new season, so to speak, the playoffs. You want to try to give guys a chance to get in there, you know, get their feet wet so that if you do have to call on them later in the series, they're prepared. It's not the first appearance they're making. Steven spoils the 3-2 pitch. There's one other aspect of tonight's ballgame, Bob, that I look at. A guy like El Duque, who gives you a lot of motion, he can actually throw your timing off where it affects you for a couple of days, not just one day. It's like a knuckleball pitcher. You know, knuckleball pitchers can put a whole team in a slump. And a guy like El Duque throwing elbow, arms, and everything else can get you off balance. Because I'm watching here, and I'm seeing some pretty good pitches to hit, and they're not able to put them in play. He is a high socks wearing, high kicking, <laughs> freewheeling, throwback son of a gun. And he likes the center stage. I think that's the key. Oh, yeah. He loves being the guy in the middle out there. Defected the day after Christmas, 1997. 12 and 4 in his rookie major league season, 17 and 9 this year. And after being ahead of Stevens 0 and 2, he loses it. That's his fifth walk. If you're just joining us, Don Zimmer was hit by a foul ball off the bat of the Yankees' Chuck Knobloch a few innings ago. Hit him behind the left ear. 
And that's why he has the ice bag to the side of his head. Talk about a gamer, even at age 68, Zim is a gamer. Royce Clayton's 0 for 2. And he drops the breaking ball in there. Clayton had given up on it. After tonight, the Hernandez brothers stand to be a combined 7-0 in postseason play over the last two-plus seasons. 4-0 for Levon, and El Duque on his way to his third win without a postseason defeat. Punched into center, Bernie Williams scarcely has to move. And a reminder, coming off their victory against Oklahoma a week ago, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame returned to NBC this Saturday at 2.30 Eastern to face the Sun Devils of Arizona State. They defeated those Sun Devils a year ago. Arizona State versus Notre Dame, Saturday at 2.30 Eastern on NBC. So here's Goodwin. Rodriguez is still the only Ranger to hit safely tonight. He had a double in the first and a broken bat single in the third. Hernandez has walked five, but he's yielded only two hits in six and two-thirds. His 0-1 to Goodwin is low. And there have been only a couple of other balls hit hard. Great play at first base by Tino Martinez robbed Rafael Palmero. And a nice sliding catch in right center field by Bernie Williams rocked Juan Gonzalez of a base hit. Everything else has been pretty much routine. Two and one. Good one hit 259 for the year. Jeff Nelson up in the pen. And now he's starting to struggle a little bit here with his control. This could possibly be his last inning. Takes off a couple. Now he has the sign he wants from Posada. Curveball just outside. Three and one. Well, Joe Torre and Mel Stottlemyre talking it over. Well, if he can conclude the seventh in the next few pitches, they will not have overworked it. A fly ball to left. Lede closes out the Texas 7. Stretch time at Yankee Stadium. 7-0 New York. Look out. You see Mel Stottlemyre talking to El Duque, but he calls Posada over to translate because he didn't understand what El Duque was saying. He had to do the same thing with home plate umpire Jim Joyce. He took Posada up, and he was talking to Jim Joyce, and Joyce didn't understand, so finally Posada had to interpret there as well. And you can see Stottlemyre is telling him exactly what he wants him to do. Well, Venafro went out to the mound to start the inning, but with the DH slot due, Joe Torre sent Jim Leyritz, a right-handed hitter, up to bat for Strawberry, and as soon as Leyritz was announced, Johnny Oates goes back to his bullpen for a right-handed pitcher. Well, he trails 7-0, but Oates hasn't stopped maneuvering. Well, you have Daryl Strawberry, Posada, and Rick Lede, who is left-handed also, and Posada, you could switch him around to the right side, but he's concerned with Leyritz. We'll step aside for a moment, back to Yankee Stadium, with New York leading Texas 7-0 right after this. Yankees cleanup man truly has cleaned up tonight. Huge night for Bernie Williams. Two run double, three run homer. Seven nothing New York. Danny Patterson, 28 year old right hander, in his fourth major league season, all with the Rangers, out of the bullpen. Leyritz batting for Strawberry. Leyritz, as you may know, has been a spectacular postseason performer. 
in 58 playoff and World Series at bats. He has seven home runs, almost all of them clutch. Waves at that one, and he's in an 0-2 hole. Despite the 5.67 ERA, Patterson 2-0 this year. Won 10 games for them out of the bullpen in 1997. Billy Davis and Darryl Strawberry can enjoy a laugh on the long end of a 7-0 score. Charles Chili Davis on the right. 350 career home runs and better than 1,300 career RBIs. Kind of snuck up on people, speaking of Chili. The bat is shattered. Slow roller to short. Clayton on the move gets Lairitz. Back to Chili Davis, there's some talk about him possibly retiring after this year. He says he won't play for anyone but the Yankees. They've got an option on his contract for next year, but at $4 million. And even the Yanks have to worry about the payroll to some extent. I don't know to what extent, but to <laughs> some. some extent, okay. Well, they switched seats, but they're still having fun. <laughs> I guess in their minds, you could term this as a laugher. There's Chad Curtis. You won't find any expressions to match those in the Texas dugout. It's seven zip in two different ways. On the scoreboard tonight, and in the last seven postseason games between these teams. A strike to Posada. A little different attitude on the Texas Rangers side of the field. game is now exactly three hours old as the Yankees bat in the bottom of the seventh. And Posada slices one to left. Greer on the move. Can't get to it. Cuts it off. Before it gets to the wall, Posada will try for a double anyway, and he'll make it. Good hitting there by Posada. He takes the sinker and goes the other way with it. This is a good sinker. Look at the, look at the movement on the ball. Drops down and away. And he does a good job of going the other way with it. And Rusty Greer cannot cut it off. In time to hold him to a single. And the relay back in. And Royce Clayton will give a quick shot to second. But sliding in safely is... Jorge Posada. The day is one for two with a walk. Patterson misses outside. Joe, what do you think of this first round schedule? In order to accommodate television, there are some odd off days. These two teams will be off tomorrow and then again off Friday between games two and three. But if there is a fifth game, they'd have to come back from Texas Sunday night to play here in game five Monday. Well, if you're a player, you would like to start the series, play the first two games, go to the opposing team's field, play the two games there, and then travel back here if necessary on an off day. But they have changed the way it's set up. But a lot of that, I think, has to do with the way they did it to accommodate <laughs> to accommodate the uh, wild card and the team with the best record. Lede skies one to left center field, tosses the bat aside in disgust as Greer squeezes it. Well, what this scheduling allows, I don't know if it'll happen at all this year, but for example, last year, Kevin Brown, then with the Padres, was able to start and win two of the first three games for San Diego against Houston. Now, that's a distortion. Well, it does play into the hands of a team that has one big horse. 
or it gives them a chance to use them a couple of times and maybe even three times in a series. Now it'll be Brocious. Bat in one hand. Ice pack in the other. Don Zimmer armed for action. I'm beginning to suspect he has a transistor radio in there. <laughs> Listening to John Sterling's radio call of the Yankee action. Rocious is 0 for 2 with a sacrifice bump. Swing and a miss. Regardless of what you think about the expanded playoffs, I think you'd agree that if you're going to expand the playoffs, you have to play the first round best of seven. Now this year, all eight qualifiers happen to be worthy teams, but in most years, if you're going to have eight teams in, some are going to be notably more suspect than others. And you're going to have a wild card team in some years taking on a team that's won more than 100 games, and then you put that superior team in a best of five crapshoot, especially with this weird scheduling, and if the lesser team has one ace who they can throw at you a couple of times in the first four games, it really distorts the outcome. Well, in a short series, the weaker team always has a better chance than they would have in a seven-game series. And since the first round is the only one that's guaranteed to include the wild card and perhaps a weak division winner, not so this year, but perhaps, that's the one they've got to look at. Brocious grounds it towards Zia. Across the diamond, and Scott is retired. No runs to hit a man is left. We played seven in New York. El Duque headed back out for the 7 nothing lead. On NBC, we're reminded that just yesterday, we were happy to conclude a deal that brings the Triple Crown to NBC. Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont beginning in 2001 on NBC. Well, Joe Torre said yesterday, that it was a real toss-up as to who would start this series. He said, I could have picked it out of a hat. Certainly reason to go with David Cohn, who's been a superb postseason pitcher. To go with a five-time Cy Young Award winner, Roger Clemens, even though Clemens has had an off year by his standards. Or to go to El Duque. No one's going to criticize his choice after tonight. Hernandez working into the eighth. And starting McLemore with a strike. He also felt like Hernandez and Andy Pettit pitched better here in front of the home crowd. David Cohn, Roger Clemens can handle whatever comes up on the road. He felt like they were better prepared to pitch on the road. El Duque likes this Yankee Stadium crowd, and so does Andy Pettit. Lamore is 0 for 3. Pettit gets the ball a little bit less than 48 hours from now for game two. Pettit reversed his form of a year ago where he struggled in the second half. It actually came together for him after the All-Star game with the exception of his last outing at Tampa. Four innings, six runs, six hits, six walks. So he did not end the regular season on a high note. He'll face Rick Helling in game two. The 3-1 pitch in there. But he loses him. That's the sixth walk issued by Hernandez. And it brings Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach, out of the dugout. Okay. Yvonne Rodriguez will be the hitter, followed by Rusty Greer and Juan Gonzalez. Stanton, the lefty. Nelson, the right-hander, who was throwing earlier.
it seems as if Hernandez understands what Stottlemyre is saying because Posada is just listening. He's not interpreting. Just as Jim Joyce arrives to break it up, Stottlemyre turns and heads back for the dugout. A pretty impressive line there, except for the six base on ball, bases on ball. Yvonne Rodriguez has doubled, single, lined hard to left. This was the fifth straight year that he topped 300. And he'll win his eighth consecutive gold glove. So he's always been terrific. He's always been an all-star. But this is his best year all round. And part of the reason may be that this was the first time he didn't play winter ball. And as the season moves along, especially in the heat of Texas, you can wear down a bit. Even a guy like Rodriguez, that didn't happen to him this year. Back to the mound. El Duque, who's a superb fielder, gets the force on the first. Double play. Once he delivers the pitch, he becomes a fifth infielder. That's how good he is. And he, as you said, he's an excellent defensive pitcher watch he gets into fielding position watch where he ends up he's prepared now watch he catches this ball finds the shortstop throws a little low but he gets it there in time Derek Jeter is able to turn it over and they get two so Greer who's 0 for 2 with a couple of walks bats with the bases empty 2-0 to him. Aaron Seeley, the Texas starter, did not pitch badly. His defense and the bullpen betrayed him. 2nd not block charges, throws, and retires Greer. The Yankees are three outs away from taking a 1-0 lead in the division series. For the regular season for the first time in their history, the stars of the night thanking and congratulating each other. Hernandez with eight shutout innings. Bernie Williams with a great defensive play to Rob Juan Gonzalez of a possible extra base hit when it was still only a one nothing game and the Rangers had two men on in the third inning and then a two run double in the fifth and a three run homer in the sixth. Here's a look back at what Bernie has done tonight. Excellent play and as you mentioned the game was still in doubt at that point and this is what gave the Yankees sort of a comfortable lead and then this puts the game away for the Yankees and gives them a big lead. Five RBI tonight for Bernie Williams. And he may get to swing the bat again if the Yankees can put a man on here in the bottom of the eighth. Top of the order, Knobloch, Jeter, O'Neal, and Williams if anyone reaches. Jim Gray told us a moment ago from downstairs that Hernandez is in fact finished. He threw 121 pitches, pitched two hit ball, walked six over eight innings. Jeff Facero, the veteran left-hander, who actually had a strong career record, well over 500, ERA about 3.40 for his career coming into this season, and then this disaster, first with Seattle and later with Texas. And the veteran was honest about it. He said this week, my statistics stink because I stink. You can see right there that Chuck, Chuck Knobloch, he has a sore thumb, and he took a big swing, and he, he looks, he re-injured his thumb. You can see him grasping it there. Now watch this swing, a big swing, and, you can, and he grabs his thumb immediately. And he's had this problem for, you know, about 10 days now. Left thumb, not the throwing hand. 
Down and in, two and one. Knobloch's one for three with a walk tonight. Three and one. Johnny Oates just trying to get Pacero some work here. Bringing him in at the bottom of the eighth. Looks like Nelson will be asked to finish it for the Yankees in a non-save situation. That's a strike, full count. Baseball is a game of bouncing back. You play 162, and if you're pursuing the championship, there's now an expanded postseason. You have to be able to put things behind you. Grounded toward the hole, and it's Knobloch's second hit of the night. But I don't care how professional you are and how much success you've had outside these head-to-head -head confrontations with the Yankees, there are a lot of people who are going to be headed back to the hotel tonight to think it over with a day in between, tomorrow night and off night. A lot of Texas Rangers will have to begin to wonder what it will take for them to beat the New York Yankees. And if you're the manager, you probably wish you were playing tomorrow, Bob, so you could get right back out here, you know, and make a statement yourself. Now you're going to have one more day to think about it. The fact that you have, you know, you came in here thinking, well, we're a different ball club this year, and so are they. But so far, their pitching staff has still been able to hold down your big hitters in your lineup. Although Knobloch can run, with the score 7-0, Stevens plays behind him at first. We were talking with Johnny Oates before the game, and he harkened back to the difficulties they had against Seattle a few years ago. They couldn't seem to beat the Mariners. And he actually consulted a Dallas-area psychologist and had him speak with some of the players. And... And his suggestion was that they maybe they should change the colors in the locker room. Do a lot of little different things to change their outlook on the way that they viewed the Yankees. It hasn't no, worked yet. When but it did work against Seattle. When a psychologist shares his offices with an interior decorator, you begin to suspect <laughs> his motives when he makes a recommendation like that. Well, it worked against Seattle, but it hasn't. They need to do something to get the monkey off their backs from the Yankees. But again, this is a pretty good Texas team. I, I expect them to bounce back. I really do. I, I think they're a pretty good team. And Fouled off, two and two. And I don't think that they've had bad games before and they were able to bounce back during the season. True, it's a lot more difficult in a short series like this. Gonzalez couldn't come through tonight with men on base, although he was robbed once. Greer, whom we saw a second before, lost the ball on the lights. That was the game's first run. Zeal kicked the ball at third, opened the door for the crusher, the three-run homer by Bernie Williams, four unearned runs in the Yankee sixth. All outstanding players with long track records of success. Jeter with the walk. Knobloch pushed to second, nobody out in the eighth. And that'll bring up Paul O'Neill. He's one for three with a walk. It was his hard hit ground ball that Zeal couldn't handle just before the homer by Williams in the sixth. And this is strike one. So the Yankees were supposed to be vulnerable. And in fact, that may still prove to be true. The postseason is a long haul now that the playoffs have been expanded. But there's no sign of it tonight from Joe Torre's team. By one thing, if you're the Rangers, you, you have to be afraid of also is the fact that you do not have a left-hander to come out of the bullpen to stymie some of these Yankee hitters. 
Jennifer came in and he didn't he wasn't able to stem the tide and now for trying to pitch the bottom of the eighth inning he's in trouble right away and his 0-1 pitch to O'Neill is in there well they had another lefty Mike Munoz who had been very effective and he's out of the playoffs no matter how long the Rangers last he injured his foot when he was pulling a new computer out of a box and dropped it on his foot. Well, that's a very bad break for the Rangers and also for Munoz. Well said. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> Munoz getting a jump on his Y2K problem. <laughs> Having a computer problem before the end of the millennium. A called third strike to O'Neill. And a standing ovation from the remaining fans at Yankee Stadium for Bernie Williams. Chance to pad that RBI total. They check it first. No. Ball one. Tino Martinez waiting on deck. Toward the hole and through for a base hit. Here comes Knobloch, waved home by Willie Randolph. Six RBIs for Bernie Williams tonight. And remember last year against Texas, he was 0 for 11. So he's trying to make up for it in one night. Fastball up, and he rips it in the hole. Good job of base running by Chuck Knobloch to be able to score. He got a great jump on the ball, and he scores easily from second base. So Williams has doubled, homered, and singled in his last three trips. Up steps Martinez. One for three with a walk thrown in. Eight runs, ten hits, no errors for New York. 0-2-1 for Texas. Fly ball right field, Juan Gonzalez makes the play. Runner tags and moves to third, so first and third with two down on the New York game. the second at bat for Leyritz this time against the left-handed pitcher when they announced him for strawberry in the seventh Oates went to the bullpen for a right-hander Williams at first Jeter at third a run home in the eighth eight nothing New York Leyritz hits with two outs And Joe Torres getting Jim Lairs a couple of bats in this ballgame. Everything has worked out very well for the Yankees. Even Zim seems to be feeling better. <laughs> and Lairs whacks one to center, but Goodwin has it lined up. He's tacked on another. And after eight, they lead by eight. Nelson will come on to try and finish it with plenty of room to spare. Joe Torre goes to his bench and his bullpen. As we move to the ninth, Chad Curtis will 
will get a little time in in left field. Paul O'Neill, who wasn't right, is out of the game. Ricky Lede goes from left to right. And Jeff Nelson will be asked to close it out with an 8-0 lead. I think Jeff Nelson, a big important part of this bullpen if they're going to be able to repeat as world champions. He was an integral part last year and he needs to pick up again where he left off. Juan Gonzalez starts it in the ninth. 0 for 2 with a walk. Gonzalez will be 30 in about a week or so. He already has 340 career home runs. That's impressive. Very impressive. But Ken Griffey Jr. won't be 30 until next month, and he's at almost 400. 398 or 9. Yeah, 398, I think it is. Yeah, 98 or 9. Yeah, right in there. And he's the guy most people say has the best chance, if anybody has a shot, at overtaking Hank Aaron for the all-time home run leadership. Yeah, but I tell you what, if McGuire keeps hitting 63, he'll get there pretty quick also. Gonzalez gets back to the dugout pretty quick, down on strikes. And a night to forget for him. I think I saw a number with, that said if McGuire hits 60 home runs for the next three years, he will have one more than Babe Ruth. Well, let's see. He's at 522. He went past Williams and McCovey. So he needs 63 a year for about for three more. That'll be 189. Only well, he needs to get to 715 to nudge past the bay. He's roughly three seasons like the last couple away. away. Right. Of course, he's got a few years on Griffey. So you have to wonder how long he can sustain it. Palmero's retired. Now blocked to Martinez. Can't tell by the expression, but he's winning 8 <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the other New York team has begun its game at Arizona, and they've taken a 1-0 lead on Randy Johnson and the D-backs. Edgardo Alfonso is homered, we're told. And earlier today, Houston beats Atlanta 6-1. Caminiti homers. Reynolds beats Maddox. A strike to Zeal. One strike away from finishing it. This will be the Yankees' eighth postseason win in a row. After they were down two games to one against the Indians, they won three straight against Cleveland, swept San Diego in the World Series, and now they're about to go up 1-0 on Texas. Pop over toward the stands wide of first, no play for Martinez. Well, this may not be as good a team as they had last year record-wise, but you've got Derek Jeter, who is a better player this year than he was last year. You have Jeter. I mean, Derek Jeter, who's better. You got Bernie Williams, who looks like he's better. A couple of guys' numbers fell off a little bit. But, I mean, they're still a very, very good ball club, and they're a very intelligent ball club with a lot of experience. And a team with four 100 RBI men. And a, a fifth, this guy Zeal, with 98. Held to just two measly hits tonight. Both of them by Yvonne Rodriguez. And I definitely didn't believe that they could shut the Rangers down totally as they have done. The one-two pitch. This is two and two. Game two starter, Andy Pettit serene figure in the Yankee dugout. Nelson's 2-2 pitch, full count. The veteran Nelson is 32 years old. He's with the Mariners from 92 to 95. With the Yankees the second half of the decade. 6-8, 235. 
in his eighth big league season. And he walks Zeal to prolong the night. Nelson was 2-1 this year. His ERA was 4.15. Basically used in middle relief or as a setup man. So Torrey shaking his head, perhaps thinking, what have you got to lose by just laying it in there? We're trying to get out of here. A swing and a miss by Lee Stevens. Manager never likes to see a guy walk hitters when you have a large lead. Oh, and you're just looking forward to a late dinner. Sliced foul. Again, a strike away. This game is at three hours and 36 minutes and counting. minute of it much fun for Johnny Oates. Nelson's 0-2 pitch. In the air to center. It's fitting that Bernie Williams should end it. take the first step in pursuit of their 36th pennant and 25th world championship. The customary Frank Sinatra ceremony.